you're the first person that sort of recognized that this could be the end of my Marvel <laughs> life. And I, I, I respect that because that's how I go about things. Hey, Richard. Hey, Gemma. Thanks for talking Hi. to Channel News Asia. Hi, how are you? Richard, you first. Was it everything you thought it was going to be? Because I know you're a Marvel film fan. Everything and more. It was um, it was such a unique experience and surreal to be in an environment or even to talk about Thanos or Thor. And I'm such a fan of the movie, so I'm used to kind of watching that world. And suddenly you have to do a big shift and be like, oh, I'm in that world now. I need to be norm <laughs> normal when I talk about these characters, not like, yeah, Thor. Um, Did so you geek out at all? Geek out all the time. Or, you know, even on, you know, on Kingo's jet, we had... Um, we had Captain America's shield on the jet, like he's bought it as a, a kind of thing that he keeps a memento. So there's these little nibbles of things that we see throughout the film that you're like, oh, that's cool. You know, and we had even even getting the costumes prepared, the, the, the costume designer had all the other, you know, a bunch of characters from the MCU, their costumes there for us to reference and look at. So you're standing there touching Captain America's costume, like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Gemma, this is your second time in the Marvel Universe. I really wasn't expecting to be back at all. I was I was as surprised as anyone else. Uh, and I definitely didn't expect to be back so soon. But I I feel just, yeah, so lucky. So I wanted to be given a second go and to be in this very different film, playing a very different character with this, you know, incredible cast. Hey, Chloe. Hey, kid. How are you? Hi. Good, how are you? Congratulations on the movie. I felt, Chloe, that this was so different from all the other MCU films. I came out feeling hopeful and melancholic at the same time. I'm not sure that's what you were trying to get at, but that was what I got. <laughs> you might be surprised to find out that I, uh, when I was hired to do Eternals, I haven't even made Nomadland yet. They hired me based on the rider mm. and my pitch. <sighs> Yeah, and then and then uh, only after I finished shooting Eternals did I start editing Nomadland. Mm -hmm. So, so wow. these two babies, yeah, I grew up with them. But you know, every single film I've ever made, which is very few of them, people have said they left feeling melancholy. That's my thing. I'm a melancholy director. I like that. I felt it though. So who does do that? You. Thank you. Well, I'm staying consistent. That's good. <laughs> Sorry, Kit, saying yes to the movie, I'm sure had something to do with Chloe as well, because obviously coming in and knowing that this part, as Kevin Feige might say, could grow into something bigger, but you never know in the MCU universe. So in saying yes to the, to the work, what was like the biggest motivation? Thank you, by the way, for saying you never know in the MCU. You're the first person that sort of recognized that this could be the end of my Marvel <laughs> life and I, I i respect that because that's how i go about things look i thought if i got a chance to work with chloe that you know because you have to look at this is once you've looked at the character you looked at what could happen you then go back to well what's the movie that i'm doing and what's my role in it who am i working with and there were three um the three factors the two factors once i'd looked at the character and and those were who you know who, am, who what's this movie representing and I looked at the cast and I'd, I saw so many different names, faces, shapes, sizes, you know. And and the other thing was Chloe. And um, I mean, you know, with the, the rider that I'd seen, you know, I, I essentially thought that's a really interesting director to work with right now. Um, so yeah, that was my decision making. What's the prep work like to play a 7,000 year old being? For me, a lot of it actually starting in a really lovely place of me and Gemma just sitting down. We've been friends for over 10 years. So that kind of made it easier rather than kind of meeting an actor for the first time and then having to go into trying to make a character. We were able to sit together and say, okay, what is it that's kept these two together? What do they see in the world and in each other that has kept them together for so many years? So that was kind of one of the one of the benefits of knowing Gemma for so long is that we got to kind of skip that initial bit and go straight into building a story, which which takes some time. Gemma, does making being friends easier to act with Richard or the fact because this is the first time you guys are doing this together as well? Yeah. 
Yeah, it is. And we've known each other for so long. Um, no, it felt really natural. And to have that trust and that ease with one another, you know, we know how to make each other laugh. We are also not afraid to look stupid in front of one another. We've, we've been in every scenario and, you know, it's, yeah, it's great. It's great to know how to push each other's buttons and, um, yeah, to have that shorthand. I wanted to ask Richard, because of all that flying scenes that you had to do, I want to know what it's like. How does one prep to be like flying? And you've got no cape, which you repeatedly say in the show as well. You prep by doing it. You prep by working with the stunts team and trying on getting into these harnesses that connect with bolts and screws and they pull you up three stories high and drop you down and flip you around and rotate you. And you kind of learn by doing because you have to get used to that and used to how it makes you feel to then be able to add in costume, add in acting, and try and make it all look graceful. So it's kind of a process of learn by doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I really felt for you, Richard, as all those hours you have to spend on the wires. I mean, I, I had to do a little bit in the film and I was like, that's enough. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, but no, I mean, a lot of what Cersei does is she she's able to, her powers are that she can manipulate matter. So she's touching objects. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I got it. Very tactile. <laughs> yes, tactile. I read that you love Christopher Nolan and you geeked out over Interstellar and then you got to watch Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Yeah. I love it when directors learn or yeah. glean something from each other. I wanted to know how much of that um, contributed to the final product that is Eternals. Obviously, I admired Denis' work for a long time. But I didn't watch Dune before I shot Eternal because he hasn't even, he was shooting Got Dune it. while, I, you know. So the timeline is that once I finished editing Eternals, when it's album's over, I was given an IMAX presentation of what we could do in IMAX. And I had no experience of doing, of making decisions of the aspect ratio. So, but I heard someone over there said, didn't even know if did a great, amazing thing with Dune. And I said, hey, can you show it to me so I can, Steal, mm. steal your ideas <laughs> for my movie. <laughs> and he said, sure. Um, and then that's that's more the timeline. And he also said, don't forget to rewatch Interstellar. And I did. And and that film is I it's just one of my favorite movies. And it's so ahead of its time. When you love something, you protect it. <laughs> 